Welcome to another lesson from Master Criminals. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the many blessings that you give us. Be with us in our time as we study your word, grow us in our faith, and help us to learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me five objects you open. Biblical names people give to newborns. Things you can do with a pumpkin. Places pets are prohibited. Things you can do to make a sore throat feel better. Our criminals today are Saul and the medium of Endor. Their crime, necromancy. That means using witchcraft to attempt to speak to the dead. This happened circa 1009 BC, around the time Archippus served as Archon of Athens. What's an Archon, you ask? Let me tell you. It's the chief magistrate in many city-states during a time when kings were being suppressed by aristocrats. This would be in ancient Greece. If you want to read more about the story, you can turn to 1 Samuel 28, verses 3 to 25. Do you like ghost stories? How about witches or secret rituals or tales of people being brought back from the dead? then you'll love this story. It's one of the weirdest, freakiest, most supernatural accounts in the Bible. Trying to figure out what really happened baffles the brain. Good and evil, though those are pretty straightforward. And it starts with Saul. Saul the brave, Saul the kind, Saul the magnificent. In many ways, King Saul looked like a good king. He defeated foreign armies, he cast down idols, he threw out the witches and sorcerers who defiled God's people, plus he was really tall. But Saul became paranoid and obsessed with power, and sadly for him, the taller they are, the farther they have to fall. To understand this account, two facts need to be clear. First, Saul had hardened his heart to God's words, and secondly, God had rejected Saul as king, choosing David in his place. With Samuel, the old prophet and advisor, dead, and the high priest aligned with David, Saul felt very much alone. This is where we hear the one good thing about Saul in this chapter. He exiled the mediums and necromancers from Israel. God's position on any form of witchcraft was that it had to go. That reminds me, Deuteronomy 18, 10-12 says, there shall not be found among you anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. So yea, Saul, but as the verse that follow indicate, it seems this was an act of mere outward obedience. Saul looked out and saw a massive army of Philistines waiting to tear Israel's army to shreds. In the past, this would have been no big deal. Saul slew his thousands, and God brought him numerous victories over the years. But see, Saul no longer trusted God to provide fully. And seeing all those angry Philistines, well, that sent Saul quaking in his boots. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. God had indeed rejected Saul. Do not think that Saul inquired of God in true faith and humility, for that is the sort of prayer God always answers. Saul asked instead in fear and pride, and God stayed silent. If only Saul had taken this as motivation to throw himself on God's mercy and repent of his sin, Saul the man would have found forgiveness, even if Saul the king could not retain his throne. However, Saul knew the Lord was not with him anymore and that he'd be facing the Philistines on his own. And he did a quick about face from asking the Lord for guidance to seeking help from the one who dwelled in evil. He asked his servants to find a medium, one through whom he hoped to talk to the dead. Saul wanted to know the future, 
and his servants knew just the witchy woman, a medium who lived at Indoor. And before you ask, no, there are no Ewoks. That's not in this story. That's a different Indoor. As further proof that he was up to no good, Saul disguised himself and crept out with two men at night to find the medium. If he had been sneaking off to get some pancakes, that would have been one thing. But a trip in disguise at night near enemy territory? Well, that can only be bad. When he found the medium, Saul didn't mess around. Divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. No pretending he was lost and needed directions. Saul was fully embracing his dark side. Don't you know what King Saul proclaimed? She asked. He kicked all the mediums and necromancers out and outlawed their dark arts. Are you trying to get me killed? How far Saul had fallen, that he sought help from a source he'd earlier condemned in the severest terms. And what was she supposed to do when he showed up at her door? Turning him away could be deadly, but doing what he said surely felt like a setup. She'd be a sympathetic character if the nature of her profession wasn't so utterly demonic. At least Saul addressed her concern, though he did it in the worst way possible. He actually swore by the Lord that it was fine for her to do an evil thing, to commit an act the Lord detested. Leviticus 20:27 20, says, A man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. Which is not God's way of saying, sure, do it if you need to. Perhaps sighing because she could see this stranger in disguise wasn't going to leave otherwise. She gave in. All right, what dead guy do you want me to talk to? Saul couldn't answer quickly enough. Samuel, I want Samuel. This was yet another sign of how corrupted Saul's thinking and heart had become. Why in a million years did he think Samuel would respond favorably to Saul summoning him through a medium? Samuel served in the Lord's house as a boy, ruled as a judge of Israel, and communicated God's word as a prophet. This was like hiring a kidnapper to snatch a blind date for dinner. Even if it worked perfectly, it wasn't going to make anyone happy. Just wondering. By many standards, the medium of Endor was kind to Saul. We'll get to this later, but she let him in, she did as he asked, she cooked a feast in the middle of the night, and she encouraged him to regain his strength. Does being a good person make someone a good person in God's eyes? What's the difference between kindness performed in faith and love for God versus kindness done apart from it? Possibly before she could even put on her normal medium show that she used to trick customers, the ghost of Samuel appeared to her. She screamed. Why did you trick me? She demanded. You're Saul, aren't you? Either she thought Samuel would appear only for Saul. She suddenly noticed how tall her visitor was, or she figured it out some other way. Regardless, she was freaked out both by what she saw and by what she feared Saul might do to her for breaking his law. This reminds me. Luke 24 features a much happier ghost story when the resurrected Jesus appeared in the closed room with the disciples. They thought he might be a ghost, but in response, he says, touch me, see my hands and my feet, and then he ate some fish. Ghosts don't eat fish. Okay, back to Saul. So Saul tries to keep her back on track. Calm down, he says, just tell me what you see. And it worked. She took a deep breath and she said, he's an old man wrapped in a robe. From that description, it could have been Gandalf, Obi-Wan Kenobi, it could have been your grandpa in the morning, but it was good enough for Saul. He just knew it was Samuel, so he bowed his head in respect. A note before we go further. For the next part of our story, we'll refer to this mysterious figure as Samuel. His true identity is the matter of much debate, and we'll cover that a little bit later. Also, consider that unlike the usual way of doing things, this quote-unquote spirit spoke directly to Saul, not through the medium. Okay, back to our story. Samuel basically said, what did you have to bug me for? And Saul, well, he whined. I'm pretty upset here too. God won't talk to me, so I need you to tell me what to do. What are you asking me for? Replied Samuel, reminding Saul that Samuel was fully in God's corner. But like you said, 
God's not on your side anymore, and he's taken your kingdom away. He did this because you disobeyed him. But since you bothered bringing me here, you should know that the Philistines, those guys standing out there, they're going to trounce you. And you and your sons, they'll be dead, like me, tomorrow. With that, Samuel went away, and Saul fell on his face in stark, raving terror. He couldn't even move. The medium tried to help. Look, I did what you asked. Could you just get up and eat a little something so you don't collapse on the walk back? Saul was too upset, so he said no way, but his servants insisted, and they got him to sit on the bed. The medium, who apparently had skills besides pretending to summon the dead, cooked up a storm. In the middle of the night, she killed the fattest calf. She cooked it, and she baked a few loaves of bread for Saul and his servants, and they ate it right up and left while it was still dark. And yes, just to be clear, Saul did die in battle with the Philistines, and his sons, including David's friend Jonathan, died the same day. The words spoken to him were a true prophecy of the future. That's the account, but before closing it out, let's get back to this mysterious ghost of Samuel. Was it really Samuel? First, the easy answer. No medium, psychic, spiritualist, or the like can contact the dead. They don't have that power. The dead no longer touch the world of the living. In particular, God is not going to allow someone who uses evil means to bring someone enjoying the glory of heaven back to earth for an idle chat. That's just not how it works. From that, the conclusion would be that it must have been an evil spirit, a demon in disguise as Samuel. The challenge with that is that the prophecy it came true. Satan, we are told, does not know the future. He knows many things about the past and present, but he's not God. He's not all-knowing. Yet somehow this Samuel knew the future. Some have suggested that perhaps God worked apart from the medium to grant a special exception, maybe a bit like Moses and Elijah appearing at the Transfiguration to make Samuel appear and speak. This feels, however, like an odd way for God to work, given what we know of what he says and does elsewhere in scripture. What might be the best possibility is that this was a demon pretending to be Samuel, but that God compelled it to speak the truth and gave it the words he wanted Saul to hear. While demons are utterly against God, he does have the power to do with them as he wishes. Whatever the truth is about this Samuel, what mattered were his words, which condemned Saul and predicted his death. God's judgment upon Saul was locked in, and Saul's own horrid decisions had made it so. Finally, as for the medium of Endor, scripture gives no clue what happened to her before or after. Odds are, her fate was less than pleasant, for there was no reason to expect any kind of repentance. In conclusion, Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium, seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. All of that comes from 1 Chronicles 10, 13 to 14. This tale seems more appropriate for a late night around the campfire. So what is it doing in the Bible? Like all the other words, the Holy Spirit inspired to be in scripture. God has a plan and a purpose for this sad story of Saul. A simple take would be to say that if you have to sneak around at night for fear of being caught, you should probably rethink what you're doing. A bit more thought might lead to say it shows the dangers of power and how those in authority should take care not to think themselves beyond the law. That's a good lesson too, and while it's wise advice and basic morality are worthwhile, uh, yeah, they're not central to God's purpose. God is always concerned with relationships, namely our relationship with him, for that is the relationship that saves us. As king, Saul was in an excellent position to hear God's words through the prophets and priests, but he ignored them. He ignored also the voice of his own conscience until his heart became so hard to God's will 
that he simply did as he pleased, with perhaps a half-sincere prayer thrown out every now and then for appearance's sake. He destroyed his relationship with God by chipping away until nothing was left. The dangers of ignoring our relationship with God, of thinking, it's only a little sin, or I'll do it just this once, are clear. Saul started down that long road much earlier, ignoring what God commanded him to do, and later harboring jealousy and murderous anger against David. It brought him straight to someone who had no problem chatting up evil spirits. Ultimately, it's a road that leads to spiritual destruction. Not all small sins lead to the same larger sins, but none of them takes us in a good direction. Saul is a warning to be alert for sin in our lives and to place our trust fully in the one who has all the right and good answers we will ever need. We trust in God purely by his grace as strengthened and directed by his means of grace, by his word, baptism, and holy communion. The God who gives us such amazing gifts is the God who called Samuel home to eternal joy and the God who wants the same for us. In this account, we also are clued in to why God hates misguided attempts to speak with the dead or practice witchcraft. It's simple. God hates false hope. We cannot actually speak to the dead and expect them to hear. Apart from the one who died and then rose back to life again, which means that he is not dead at all. But that's part of the message, too. God is the God of the living, not the dead. He delights in giving us life, preserving life, and resurrecting life to the eternal one we will enjoy forever with him in heaven. He wants us to rely on the true hope that Christ's resurrection is ours as well. Just as our souls will be with God, so too our bodies will be raised in service and praise to our ever-living God. Finally, if you want to feel in touch with the dead, Try out the communion of saints. At the altar of the Lord's Supper, we become a part of the whole, of the eternal marriage feast of the Lamb, where our fellow guests are all those who died in the faith, who hold to it now, and who will in the future. Bonus features. From psychics to Ouija boards to horoscopes and fortune cookies, there are numerous ways people seek to discover the future or to peek beyond the grave. God tells us that such hopes, they're false. The details of the future are for God alone to know, and the dead do not return to speak to the living. The only voices who will answer you in such a situation are people trying to con you, or much worse, evil spirits, maybe even Satan himself. Messing around with seemingly innocent witchcraft or attempts to speak to the dead, it's only going to lead you one way, toward evil, darkness, and danger. Just don't do it. After meeting numerous frauds during attempts to contact his dead mother, the legendary magician and escape artist, Harry Houdini, came to despise the fake spiritualists who were popular in his day, the early 20th century. He actively sought to disprove these psychics and mediums. He would show up at seances in disguise and use all the knowledge he'd gained as an illusionist to show them for the frauds they were. He even offered a large cash prize for anyone who could create a spiritualist act that he couldn't duplicate. In the end, Houdini occupied an uncertain position between hating fakes, yet hoping there truly was a way to speak with those who were dead. Saul was mixed up about where to go to get the right answers. Asking God once and then seeking devilish advice, that's a terrible idea. Even today, it can be hard to find quality solutions to our problems. Fortunately, for the most important questions, the Bible is there to help. For many non-spiritual matters, though, you have to find just the right resources. Consider these resources to find good answers in different situations. And no, the internet does not count. Where would you go for these answers? The definition of necromancer. How about a dictionary? What about how to make sure your cookies have just the right number of chocolate chips? Well, you could go to your grandma, or at least a grandma. Call me biased, but I think as a mom, I might have some good answers too. All right, bigger question. Why God lets bad things happen to good people? That's a heavy question. I recommend you go to your pastor for that one. 
How about the best flowers to say, you're awesome, but I'm not in love or anything. How about a florist? They'd have some good suggestions. How to ransack a village without completely destroying it. Duh, ask a Viking. What your best friend did last summer, last week, or two minutes ago. Check social media platforms of your choice. Surely it's shared out there, right? What about the best place to bury a bone? Another one, duh, ask the dog down the street. How to jump into a chalk drawing? Because we all want to do that, right? Mary Poppins, of course. All right, pretty much anything else you wanna know? Well, this says a librarian, and it said the internet doesn't count, but maybe we can make an exception. Seems like Wikipedia has all the answers. I don't know if I trust them, but. Thanks for your time today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Gracious Father, you are a good and wonderful Father. You have taught us so many things in the Ten Commandments, and so much of that comes through in this, um, in this study, especially to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, to honor your word and to not despise it, to turn and look to you for all the things that we need, Lord. It reminds us of the ninth and 10th commandments, which also tell us to be content. So many times we want to be in control of our own lives, Lord. Help us to be content. When we try to look to the future, when we try to be in control and know what's happening, we're not giving that power to you. We're not trusting in your power, Lord. Help us to trust in you. Help us to use um, self-control and discipline. Help us to resist the temptation to do the little sins and the big ones too. Help us to seek your forgiveness for all of our sins. Thank you for the means of grace, the gifts that you give us through your sacraments, the gift of forgiveness and ultimately the gift of salvation and eternal life with you, Lord. We lift all this up to you in your son's most holy and precious name. In Jesus we pray. Amen.